This is the Free Hill Life Podcast number 14. I'm your host, Josh Madsen, coming at you from the Free Hill Life shop in Salt Lake City, Utah. And we are back for another edition of this fun little ditty that uh, you guys are so kind to listen to. And I'm stoked. It's uh, it's crazy that we're already into number 14. I think I'm going to say that every week. I'm sure I'll have to come up with something more original. But thank you for listening out there. I really, really appreciate it. And uh, it's fun to get to know everybody from uh, the emails that you're sending in and questions you're asking. And I know uh, even just meeting people in person uh, when I've been at events recently, it's uh, it's pretty cool. It's like having radio again for all of those people that can remember those days. So uh, a couple newsroom items as always. The biggest and most important day of the year, World Telemark Day. March 7th, please, please reach out to me. Uh, Either email the podcast at freehealllife.com email. Let us know if you're putting a gathering together. If you haven't listened to the episode, I always am kind of encouraging people to listen to that episode uh, about World Telemark Day and what it is. The gist of it is it's our day to go telemark skiing. You can be by yourself. You can take a friend. uh, You can put a group of people together. You're probably not going to be putting a festival together by the time you hear this, but uh, <clears throat> it's just a day for us to all go telemark skiing around the world. It's always the first Saturday in March in the Northern Hemisphere, first Saturday in September in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, so yeah, it's coming up March 7th and uh, it's going to be an awesome day of celebration. You can, if you're a social media person, uh, you can always uh, just hashtag world telemark day spread telemark on that day as well we're going to try and share as many photos as we can i always love seeing all the interesting places people are 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 coming in from and sending photos i know you're out there and you know you're out there and this is our chance to kind of come together on on a singular day and uh, really share that with the world and hopefully find some other people out there and i know it always kind of jogs that uh, curiosity in my brain of where in the world, uh, you know, we could go on an, on an adventure at some point. And I think about all the, the cool people I've met through Telemark. And uh, now we can, you know, if you can't, if you don't have the ability and uh, resources to travel, uh, this is a cool way to get to know people from around the world and, and kind of share a, a commonality. And, uh, yeah, I can't I can't emphasize it enough. It's really cool that this binds us all together. So make sure uh, to get out and telemark ski on March 7th. Uh, you have all telemark skiers permission to go do it. Uh, we just made a decision here. Normally we stick around Utah, the shop crew, myself, and uh, traditionally that's what we've done uh, is try to do something around here uh, this year. We have decided kind of last minute that we are going to take most of the crew from the Free Hill Life shop and we're going to be going to Pebble Creek, Idaho. And we'll be there uh, for their event on March 8th, which is the day after World Telmark Day, but it's World Telmark Day weekend. So we're going to be there hanging out, uh, hopefully meet uh, more people from that little crew in Southern Idaho. Uh, they've had a strong tele crew for, for a number of years. And this is actually going to be my first time going to old Pebble Creek. And I'm excited about that. Um, I, I love, I love to see all these strong places out there. I know, uh, another one that kind of came to mind this week is someone sent me a photo this morning of, uh, my buddy Keith Wood sent me a, uh, he's from, uh, Ontario, Canada but he actually sent me a photo of an event he went to in Ellicottville, New York, which is Western New York, uh, just South of Buffalo. And, uh, there's a great shop there called the city garage and, uh, holiday Valley and, uh, Holly Mont's there as well. But, uh, holiday Valley hosted, uh, the city garages event called Telly stock. And man, it's so cool. They had over a hundred people there and it's, it's events like these, grassroots events people are taking the time out of their you know out of their busy schedules to come together um organize these events as as a group you know these shops and these people and uh it's so so important that that we keep that uh keep that going and and uh 
the more the merrier because you know it's it's it takes a lot to put a little event together and and even as as simple as you can think of it it, it can definitely be uh time consuming so highly highly recommend uh yeah find find some friends and and at least start with world telemark day and that's a good way to to get going uh, there's definitely some other events coming up. I think next week I'll do a, a more comprehensive one. Uh, maybe some more European events and some other ones in the United States. And we'll we'll try to do that. So today we're going to do a little solo one again. And uh, last week's mailbag episode kind of got me thinking about one of my favorite trips and one of my favorite places that I've ever traveled to. And that is Morgadal, Norway. <clears throat> for those of you that are maybe just getting into telemark skiing or maybe you're not as nerded out on the the uh the history of telemark uh Morgadal is a small town in the southern part of norway uh it's considered the cradle of modern skiing and it was the home of sondre norheim and Sondre Norheim is really considered the father of modern skiing, but especially uh, the the guy really credited with with developing the Telemark turn. I probably need to do some deeper digging. I always wonder kind of who all those other people were around, you know, that were also doing that. Uh, but the 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 turn was all obviously created by these people in Telemark. And for those of you that maybe aren't familiar with with telemark or maybe never really thought about what the where the word came from it's really just a region in in norway um and uh there's obviously various cities um in that vicinity uh that make up uh make up telemark so uh i think the first time i ever went to to um, Morgan all myself. And I kind of touched on this in the last podcast. Uh, I believe it was 2010, somewhere around there, 2009, 10. <clears throat> and, uh, I was kind of, jo- if you listen to the last podcast, I was kind of joking because I remember reading about Morgan all as a young kid. When I started telemark skiing, uh, you know, I learned from a book and I read about this, you know, this brief little snippet, you know, about Morgadal and Telemark, Norway. So of course I've played it up in my head, you know, for, uh, you know, years and years and years and, it, you know, come to find out I, I'm, I'm headed, headed to go to Morgadal and, uh, you know, I talk to the people on the airline and the people I'm sitting next to, you know, I get to the bus station, talking to people on the bus and no one quite knew what I was talking about. <laughs> I think some people had heard about it, but I can't emphasize enough how important of a place this is. And, uh, man, what, what a cool place. Um, and if you're listening out there and I get anything wrong as I'm kind of going through this stuff, please, please email me, let me know. I I'm always down to make corrections. Um, I'm more just an, an avid Morgadal enthusiast and Telemark enthusiast and sharing whatever little nuggets of knowledge I've come across over the years. Um, that's kind of the purpose here. So hopefully you don't hold me to, uh, <laughs> too high of a standard. Um, as I'm, uh, trying to be an amateur historian here. So, but I thought today would be a cool opportunity to kind of go over, five, five things that I thought were pretty interesting about Morgadal, um, from, from the two visits that I've done. Most of these probably were things that came up in the first visit. And, uh, you know, now, now looking back, I, I still think these are five of the, the things that stand out the most to me. The first thing that kind of stuck out to me, I actually got there. I was looking back at my notes from that trip and it's a pretty easy place to get to. Um, you know, you, you can fly into Oslo, um, and then basically you can, if you know, renting a car isn't very difficult at all. If you want to do that, I actually took a bus the first time. Um, and that was, uh, 
<laughs> that was a pretty cool experience more just cause you're kind of cruising through this space that you don't, you know, you don't really, um, yeah, I didn't really know where I was going, you know, and, uh, you're, you, you basically take this highway, uh, just going, I'm sorry, going West from Oslo, the E one thirty four, as it were. And it's going to kind of take you through the countryside, um, through a bunch of these, these other towns and, and take you over to, uh, Morgadal. And I remember I got in, in the dark. So there, I don't know if I really, I just remember kind of getting out on, on a snowy two lane highway and kind of getting dropped off the, the side of the road. And, and remember thinking, man, this is, this feels pretty old school, you know, kind of like a, uh, you know, just kind of getting dropped off in the middle of some town and, and you don't really know where you're at. And, uh, you know, snow covered, small, very quiet, no lights and, you know, stars out. And it's kind of one of those amazing experiences, you know, I think any of us that love the outdoors have, uh, these days, especially, um, you know, is, is getting away from major cities where there's just tons of light and, uh, being out in almost that wilderness feel, but you're still in a town and it just feels like a very much more pure kind of experience to me, you know, when you're in places like that. So I think the, I, I feel like getting off that bus kind of fit the bill for me right off the bat. Cause I was like, you know, it just, it just felt like this amazing place and I hadn't even seen it yet. So, um, you know, I got to my hotel, I woke up the next day and I think the thing that was most striking, you know, I was kind of in this, there's a cool little hotel. Um, I think it's still open. It's, it's literally right in town. You're talking a, a, a town, I think currently, I didn't look up current population. I, I think it's somewhere between 200 and 250 people. So not super large. Um, but if you can imagine, um, it's, it's kind of like waking when I wake up and I look out across this kind of little valley, um, there's a little lake kind of in the center. And then there's sort of a, an amphitheater of small houses, if you will, kind of up on the hillside and everywhere around you is just sort of rolling hills. And it kind of reminds me of, um, if you've been to the United States, it's definitely more of, of a rolling hill type of thing. It's not crazy mountainous and rugged that way. There are a couple faces that are, you know, rockier and um, some little outcrops. But it definitely seems more of a, a rolling type of, of geography rather than, you know, like you're in the middle of the Alps or something like that. And that would, that would actually make sense too, because, um, to kind of give you an idea of, of, of how high it is, it sits 426 meters above sea level, sea level, which is just about 1400 feet. And it's in an area it's known for its snowy winters, um, you know, mild summers. And it's basically kind of like a mixture of like I was saying, kind of rocky terrain, but coniferous trees and kind of rolling hills. So you're not really that high off the ocean and it doesn't really, yeah, it doesn't really feel like high Alpine or anything like that, which is kind of cool. I've, I've always, I think that was the first thing that stuck out to me is like, man, it's so cool that such an important thing in skiing came from a, a place like this. It wasn't in some epic, you know, steep, gnarly terrain, you know, it was about, um, people in this, in this area where ski skiing as a traveling tool was now being looked at as something as, as sort of a recreation. And for me, that's like some, one of the coolest things is, is to kind of have be in a place where something transitioned from something that was kind of utilized more as a tool to something that people were having fun with. And I just think that's, that's such a cool thing. Um, so obviously 
I kind of gave a brief description of sort of maybe what this looked like and, you know, there's some rockiness to it and, and whatnot. I think one of the stories that kind of sticks out with that terrain is, yes, there was some difficult terrain and, and I, I can't remember the exact details of this story, but I, I it just always resonated as something totally fascinating to me because there was one slope near Morgadal that was considered sort of the first extreme slope and nobody would ski it because it was so, you know, probably terrifying to people at that point, you know, like how could you possibly go down this thing on skis? And there's a fun, a kind of a fun story. Uh, and hopefully I get it as close to correct as possible. So if somebody knows this story and I miss anything, please let me know. But, no one would tackle this this slope, and of course, as the the history goes, as one day Sondre Norheim's out with another one of his friends, and they're walking around, and one of them's carrying a rifle, and the other's carrying an axe, and you know they were probably out doing some work, you know, uh, maybe hunting, uh, maybe gathering some sort of wood to make some skis. <laughs> uh, I don't I don't know exactly what they were up to, but. This, this morning, they decided that the snow looked good on this slope, and hey, what a better time to go shred this extreme-style slope that no one will do, uh, but with a firearm and a sharp tool in your hands. <laughs> so I always thought that was pretty cool, and they were the first ones to do that descent. So um, I just love thinking about the ingenuity and, and probably the fun of that era and uh, and how people were using the terrain. And, uh, you know, another thing that kind of struck me with the terrain be- was that, um, a lot of people were jumping and building jumps. And that was, uh, a pastime is building jumps to jump with your skis. And, uh, I'll kind of get into that in this next one. I think that kind of leads me into the second thing that I learned in, in Morgadal, And that's really about the equipment. I think as, as a, telemark skier who grew up in the united states i definitely had that american narrative of telemark is all about skinny skis soft leather boots and a three pin binding and uh you know that's kind of what i grew up on i mean the gear i started i started in you know 93 and uh the gear i started on was probably from the mid 80s and Telemark really re- had a resurgence maybe in the mid to late seventies. And, uh, so that's all I knew, you know, double camber, skinny skis and floppy boots. And, and there's kind of this mystique around that in, in, in the U S as to, you know, that's sort of the beginnings of Telemark here. Well, I get to Morgadal and I kind of start learning some of the history of this area. And man, was I fascinated at how, um, I don't want to say like we got it wrong in the U S uh, it more of kind of a, it's kind of a testament to the evolution of the story, really not, not the evolution of the gear. And I'll explain why in a minute, but kind of the evolution of the story about something that kind of became lost in the early 1900s and didn't really come back until there were these small groups sort of picking it up in the mid seventies and sort of experimenting with, uh, what was going on, uh, with the telemark turn. And, um, so the first thing I find out in Morgadal regarding the gear is that Sondre Norheim is really credited with creating the, the healed binding. And so when you look at the ski binding in, in Morgadal, some of the older ones were, and I believe it's birch that they were using, uh, either a root or a branch. And it's sort of a, there's sort of a process of soaking it and then kind of creating these um, kind of a, it's not really rope, kind of, kind of looks like a rope, but it's a, yeah, they, they would create these loops and the loops would actually travel through the center of the skis in a lot of cases. And that it was just a toe loop. Well, kind of, as I mentioned, a lot of, a lot of people were actually jumping on their skis. And my understanding is that 
when you're jumping and you only got a tow loop, I mean, it's great for walking around and traveling and, and, and whatnot. But when you jump, um, or maybe flip or anything like that, um, you, you have more of a chance of your ski flying off your foot. So they created another piece that goes around the heel from the toe loop. And then you slide it on the back of your boot. Um, so <clears throat> right off the bat, I'm looking at these bindings and we actually had the opportunity to make skis and learn from a traditional ski maker and make these bindings. And then we actually got to go out and ski these things on the hill. Well, here's the first thing that comes to my mind. I'm, you know, I've been on some pretty floppy gear in my day and I'm thinking, okay, cool. <laughs> I'm about to, you know, put a, you know, like a root branch looking thing on my foot, you know, like how sturdy can this possibly be? And again, I'm thinking, you know, the history of telemarks, you know, floppy bindings and, and whatnot. I slide my foot into this thing in a regular, uh, I probably, I probably had like a softer leather boot on, um, that I was borrowing from someone, but the way your toe slides in is your toe slides quite far past the loop, uh, on the ski. And I slipped a little heel thing on and I go to flex forward. And to my surprise, these bindings were incredibly active and, uh, activity meaning that pr probably what some people would perceive as stiffness. Um, usually I distinguish the two as stiffness usually comes from a spring activity comes from the pivot point. Well, the fact that you slide your toe in so far actually creates a pivot point that's pretty far back. So for those of you out there that have skied on, um, we, we always like to use the, in the shop, we like to use the hammerhead from, uh, Russell Rainey and 22 designs later on, you could actually change the pivot point much like on a lot of other bindings. This was like the equivalent. If you've skied that binding of like a hammerhead four or five because of the position of your toe through the loop. So there was definitely some slop side to side, you know, I mean, definitely note that, I mean, there's not a lot of stability laterally, but in terms of flexing forward, tons of power. <laughs> so right off the bat, I'm starting to think, okay, this is really interesting because this is not floppy and actually it's really powerful and engages the ball of my foot on my ski and I'm on a big pair of wooden skis. So that's, that's kind of interesting. So right off the bat, that kind of stuck out. So then, um, you know, we ski on those and the bindings work great. Um, like I said, lateral stability, little let left to offer. Um, but that kind of led into talking to, to some of the people about the boots. What kind of boots were these guys and girls using in the mid 1800s? You, you have to think this is like the 1860s, you know, and, um, this is, this is probably one of the crazier things I've heard. Cause again, growing up in the U S you're thinking floppy leather boots. That's what it's all about. If you're a good telly skier, you know how to ski on the old gear. Well, come to find out in Morgadal, people would actually leave their boots in their bindings with, you know, as I said, with the heel thing, sitting outside of their cottages or houses where they lived in order to let them freeze and harden overnight. Why? Because you get stiffer boots. And stiffer boots means at least you get a run or two of really good lateral stability in the morning. <laughs> Your feet might be a little cold, but you're going to have stiffer boots. So again, my mind is blown. I'm thinking, you know, uh, you know, I'm kind of unraveling my, my history in this first experience with like actual skis and bindings from Morgadal and, and boots as well. So stiff boots, not soft boots, uh, active binding, not floppy. <laughs> and then come to find out the people of Telemark and Sondre Norheim and these guys also are credited with creating side cut and, sh and shorter skis to use. And it makes total sense. 
because all of a sudden you're going from just traveling where you had these extremely long skis that were probably not very maneuverable. And now you're creating a downhill technique where you need shorter skis that turn. And guess what? They're not that skinny. Um, you know, by modern day standards, yeah, you're not skiing like a 115 or some underfoot, 115 millimeters underfoot, but these are not skinny Nordic skis. And so the gear totally blew my mind. You've got stiff boots, active bindings, and wider skis. <laughs> so it sounds completely different than the narrative that I grew up thinking was kind of the history of, of Telemark. So, and a lot of it was because they were jumping and they were trying to maneuver faster. So they wanted better lateral stability. Um, these were the things that were going on. Um, you know, just on the ski jump thing, th this is why the Telemark, uh, stance is used in a landing of a ski jump even in olympics it comes from the same area and the same a very similar history of people and, and people doing these things so man I, I i just to this day that is one of those things i'm just so stoked that i i could learn and feel and especially back then you know i had kind of just spent the last decade before that skiing you know, especially in the mid 2000s, a lot of terrain park and doing a lot of jumps and stuff like that. And I remember people, oh, there was, there was legitimately people that would come up to you and, and, or come up to me and say, man, what you're doing is it, it's cool, but it's not telemark. What, you know? And I'd be like, what are you, what are you talking about? You know, like it's not telemark. Why, why isn't it telling? Well, you're, you know, you're jumping and you're doing tricks and, you know, funny enough, you go back to Morgan all where this whole thing started and, that's what they were doing, building jumps, jumping off the roofs of houses, building jumps on the weekends with their family. And, uh, and, uh, like I said, stiff boots, active bindings and, uh, shorter skis with side cut. <laughs> so there you go. So the equipment complete mind blower and just, just an awesome, awesome story. So kind of, this kind of leads me into the next little piece of, uh, of equipment that often comes up in kind of historical talks and the traditional telemark skier. And that's the lurk. So if you don't know what a lurk is, a lurk is generally kind of like a long piece of wood that people use, um, seen it in a couple different ways, but generally people will use a lurk kind of in almost like a kayak paddle style and kind of alternate left and right kind of as they're making turns on the hill. And this often comes up because people, you know, getting into telly or they're looking for something cool to do and it's unique. Um, you know, they'll, they'll start saying, Oh man, I want to try a lurk. I want to get a lurk. Well, you find out in Morgadol really quickly that the lurk was not in vogue. <laughs> in fact, the lurk was actually used by, um, actually, so I wrote a piece on telemarkskier.com. You can still find it. This was way back in like 2015. I finally got around to writing about this. I'm just going to read this little excerpt and this is what it says. According to Tadie Gelstad, a traditional ski maker and telemark historian, skiers from Morgadol and Telemark only use a short pole, unlike a lurk, because they want something to hold. Often they only use a small part of a branch from a spruce tree. And we learned this while we were here. This was such a cool part of it, actually, because one of the funny things is, if I remember correctly how they were explaining it to us, is when they were jumping, especially, holding like a little sprig of like a pine tree, uh, in their hand with nothing else, not even the little short stick he was talking about, would actually show people superior balance. That was the way they were like, hey, check this out. I don't need anything to help support me when I land. I have great balance. And really, it was the people from Christiana, Oslo, modern day Oslo, that was called Christiana back then. And other areas were using the lurk and longer pieces. And, um, 
it kind of it kind of led me. Um, uh, I'll, I'll put a link to this in, in the notes so you guys can check it out. But um, I thought this was this was kind of a cool story that that Tadie shared with me about kind of maybe what led to that or one of the things that led to that other than wanting to express superior balance and just be badasses. He said, uh, uh, one story of two younger boys from Morgadal, uh, uh, Torius and Mikkel Hemitzvate, shed some light on why a longer and heavier tree branch might have been avoided, like a lurk. Torius and Mikkel learned their ski technique from Sondra Norheim. And aside from skiing the rolling hills of powder near their homes, they were very much interested in, I'm going to screw this up, you guys, Spreutehop, a form of ski jumping. These jumps were fashioned, fashioned to have a sharp incline to boost the participants into the air for long distances. Sondre Norheim is credited with the second longest officially recorded jump at 19 and a half meters. The jumper's objective was to stay balanced and composed as they tried to achieve the furthest distance while still landing in a telemark position. One winter, when the boys were merely 12 and 14 years of age, Torius was jumping with a longer style lurk. One jump was disastrous with Torius landing on the large wooden lurk, wounding his back. He eventually recovered from the horrible injury and as a result, both started using a shorter wooden stick in all their skiing adventures, including jumping. The shorter sticks were standard in Morgadal and used as a tool to remove snow and ice from boots, bindings, and skis before jumping and while out skiing. In some cases, jumpers like Sondre Norheim would only use the small branch of a spruce in one hand. This not only filled the void of holding something in their hands, but also exhibited their superior balance without the use of a large stick. So there you go. <laughs> uh, anyways, I always like to share this. I mean, it's kind of one of those things like if you want to use a lurk, awesome. I mean, no one's going to care that you're using a lurk. But if you really want to be true to the history, you should be rolling around with a, a smaller uh, wooden staff or even the end of a spruce tree to show your superior balance. Uh, you might get some looks in the lift line. I don't know, but, uh, so anyways, that's kind of the walk down gear. You got, you got what would have been, uh, the lack of poles, uh, heeled binding, stiff boots width of the side cut and the skis. And those were kind of the first three things that stuck out to me when I got to Morgadal. Number four, kind of touches on a little bit more modern day history. And uh, this was kind of one of the cooler things that I didn't know uh, was that uh, there's a lot of Olympic history in Morgadal. And uh, the Olympic flames from the 1952 Olympics in Oslo, uh, the 1960 Winter Olympics in Squaw Valley, and the flame used in the National Torch Relay for the 94 Winter Olympics in Lillehammer, which was later used as the flame for the 94 Winter Paralympics, were all lit at the birthplace of Sondre Norheim, Urvabur Morgadal, uh, which is the little, basically this little one-bedroom house on the hill. And there's a little fireplace in there, and that's where they lit the torch from. And uh, there's still a burning flame in Morgadal, I think, from the Olympics. I could be wrong, but there is still a torch kind of burning down in that lower part of town uh, by the statue of Sondre Norheim that kind of looks up towards Urvubur. I really wish I could say that word. And all you Norwegians, I love you. And I really wish I had the, <laughs> the O with the line through it in my vocab. I will practice it, I promise. Now that I actually have to talk on the podcast, I'm starting to realize <laughs> how important the pronunciations are. Um, so bear with me as I, as I learn. But yeah, um, where this Olympic torch was lit, you can actually um, go up there. It's a short walk from the road. And it's a, it's a cool little skin up. There's actually some cool little slopes that you can ski kind of that in the, in that vicinity. And, uh, man, what a beautiful place. And it kind of overlooks kind of where he, where he was born really overlooks kind of the little Valley 
uh, where Morgadal sits. And there's just kind of all these little farmhouses and everything spread around. And uh, it's pretty awesome. So the fifth and final thing that I learned while I was in Morgadal was about jumping. And we kind of hit on this already, but um, I, th- I cannot emphasize how much that jumping was a part of this whole experience when we went. Um, it just seemed like aside from the skiing and getting to know the terrain, it just seemed like I, I wasn't ready to, th- to hear that jumping was such a part of the culture and honestly, just the average telemark skier uh, was also a jumper. And, you know, we're not talking like ski, you know, I'm sure some 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 become ski jumpers, but it just seemed like a really commonplace thing for me where building a jump was just kind of part of the deal, you know? And what made you a well-rounded telemark skier, if you will, wasn't just making turns and, uh, you know, walking around on your skis, but it was actually jumping. And uh, it was pretty fun. When I was there, we actually had a thing called the Morgadal Games, um, which I think is an annual event. They just kind of gathered the people, all the kids together. um, And they've got a jump as part of it and some other events that you do. And it's just kind of a festive time to get together and, and celebrate. And it's just such a cool thing to think that that's kind of part of that culture there. Um. So one of the one of the guys that kind of stands out in the history of the of the jumping was uh, Sven Solid. Uh, so at one point he held the world record for ski jumping, and uh, his farm um, is there in Morgadal. And um, I'm just going to kind of re- this was another piece that I, I'll, I'll link it to it. Uh, it's called Morgadal's Mecca. I wrote this kind of about that first experience when I went there. And, um, kind of talking about, um, the Morgadal games, but this is, this is what I wrote in that piece. It just says Solid's farm is the perfect place in both spirit and pitch for the opening ceremonies and the events, a torch lighting ceremony, the, uh, Obel, Obelaren, which is an obstacle course, uh, you do while carrying a bowl of beer and of course jumping. Jumping is an import. Uh, jumping is as important to these free heel skiers as turning and style, all of which are still rooted deeply in the people of Telemark. Sondre demonstrated his mastery at local competitions like this one 150 years ago. In fact, 15 kilometers from Morgadal is Ofta. Uh, Sondre took first place in what is thought to be the world's first ski jumping competition, and that was in 1866. So. Yeah. So jumping. And again, growing up a telemark skier in the U S the last thing that I grew up thinking about as a tele skier was not jumping. It was usually like, Hey, how fast can you pull your skins off again? And I said this in an earlier podcast is a lot of people in the United States, because of how we access the backcountry for a really long time, perceive telemark to be an uphill technique. And, uh, you know, I think this really shows that the the history, yes, that is part of the history. But an, another important part of the history is telemark is a downhill technique. And also to be a well-rounded uh, telemark skier, it's, you need to know how to jump. And that's part of one, part of the techniques to really round out your, 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 uh, uh, your toolbox. And, uh, I just think that's so awesome. And I still, to this day, I'm so grateful I got to go there and kind of <laughs> experience that. And I'm, you know, jumping off a little jump. We even did it on those old wooden skis and took some falls and it was a blast. So just such, such an awesome, awesome time. And um, so those are really five things um, I kind of, you know, was able to experience while we were there uh, on my trip to Morgadal. And I thought they would be kind of a good starting point, uh, maybe for you to think about making your own journey there at some point and uh, checking it out. Uh, I think it's if you're really into the history of Telemark, and I I know I've met a lot of people that you know some people aren't into it, but there are a lot of people that are drawn to it just because it's super interesting. <laughs> and um, 
hopefully this sheds some light for you guys uh, and girls out there that are listening and you know maybe hadn't heard some of this stuff and maybe it just kind of sparks some interest for some additional reading you know on a on a snowy day or something after skiing um thank you for listening you guys if uh if you'd like to support the podcast the best way to do it uh is to buy your telemark gear at our shop here in salt lake city you can buy online at freeheallife.com uh you can uh also come into the shop uh, we're open 12 to 7 uh, monday through friday 10 to 7 on saturdays except world telemark day we are closed to go celebrate and make telly turns together uh, you can also check out articles on telemarkskier.com. And as always, please write in. Let me know how I'm doing. Uh, let me know stuff you want us to talk. Want me to talk about us to talk about. Uh, you can email podcast at freeheallife.com. And I just love you guys so much. It's such an honor to be a part of this community to be able to talk to you guys about this stuff. It fires me up every week. I get super stoked to to just talk about telemark and i love knowing that you guys are all out there and you're as fired up as i am and it just stokes me out as simple as that so thanks for listening uh please take a second to rate and 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 review the podcast on apple apple podcast that that really helps us out and we'll see you next week and until then spread telemark always